New upfront NHS charges to prevent health tourism, a new housing policy shifting focus to generation rent, and of course, Brexit still dominates the agenda. Welcome to Tip TV Politics. On the show this week, we look in focus at pressure on the government over EU citizen and British expat rights with Sue Wilson of Remain in Spain, Barbara Drozdovic of Eastern European Resource Centre and Katia Vidluck from 3 Million Voices. Joining us for our Brexit explainer, Dr Heather Rolf, Director of Employment and Social Policy at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research and in the studio to discuss all the latest from Westminster and beyond, Tom Follett of Res Publica and Emma Bean from Labour List. We start with the news of government proposals to clamp down on health tourism in the NHS. Under the plans, from April this year, hospitals in England will have a legal duty to issue upfront charges to patients if they do not qualify for free treatment. This is for patients receiving non-urgent care, that's important to remember. Um, let's start first with Emma. What's wrong with asking for upfront costs now? Well, I think the thing is, is it's just a really weird thing to focus on, right? Like, let's look at the NHS. Let's look at what's wrong with the NHS. Let's look at the social care crisis. I know a lot of people who work in the NHS, doctors, nurses, healthcare assistants. I've never heard any of them whine about this great, like, horde of foreigners who have come over here taking all of our resources, right? Like, it's a total misnomer to focus on this tiny little thing, which, like, perhaps there is a partial problem there, perhaps there are better ways to do it, but it is not up to healthcare workers to enforce border control, right? I mean, I mean you say there's a better way of doing it. The Public Accounts Committee gave their report and said the systems for cost recovery appear chaotic. So it's a sure. bit beyond just, you know, it could be done better. It yeah, for be... sure. It's something coming from the Public Accounts Committee that suggests a better option, I'm going to accept. Something coming from a Tory government that's consistently cut NHS funding, that is ignoring the social care crisis, and they're like, but we're going to get headlines on the front page of the Daily Mail and Express saying about how bad it is that there's all these healthcare tourists. I'm like, well... I'm probably not ecstatic that there, if there are people who are actually abusing the system, but the example they chose, that they chose to use with a Nigerian woman who unfortunately went into labour when she was pregnant with quadruplets, right, lost two of those babies, an incredibly sad situation, and yet they try and dress that up as though that's a woman coming over here and stealing British resources. Frankly, that sort of a political agenda involved with this makes me very sceptical of any plans that they're suggesting. I mean, Tom, this is for non-urgent care, so this isn't for someone who's going to stumble into an emergency room needing life-saving support. Um, do you think that the government's got a fair point here in wanting to recoup these costs? I mean, the NHS is a system. Um, it's disguised through the tax system, but we pay into it and we get care out. And when EU nationals are here, the, payers, the um, care is reimbursed by their home country. So the principle of foreign nationals paying for their care, which they don't pay through taxes, is kind of fair enough. Um, I mean, the exception is probably pregnancy, as Emma mentioned. You know, we probably shouldn't be charging foreign nationals if they're pregnant and they're in hospital and, you know, they need medical attention. I think a lot of people agree that's probably a little bit beyond the pale. Um, but let's not forget, I mean, the bigger issue is the social care crisis. Mm -hmm. The NHS is facing a black hole of funding because there are, are mostly elderly people who are stuck in hospital and they can't get out because there's not enough social care and they're taking up resources because there's simply not enough room in the system for them to move out. That is a huge crisis mm -hmm. which we haven't and isn't this the point? I mean, going back to the Public Health, uh, Public Accounts Committee report, uh, it said if the NHS doesn't collect money, there is less money available to treat other people and even more pressure on NHS finances. So it's, it's the right idea, isn't it, that the NHS has got such a funding problem, it needs to be recouping these massive chaotic systems which are losing them so much money. Yeah, sure, but my point is that we should be focused on where we've got systems that are failing, right? Like, for instance, social care is failing. That is blocking beds particularly on acute wards, particularly also in geriatric wards, if we're talking about, say, like the elderly people who are unfortunately can't be moved on to, say, the appropriate nursing or care homes, right? That costs us far more than the small number of non-EU immigrants who happen to use the NHS, even on the non-emergency side, right? Moreover, the way in which this has been proposed, I mean, perhaps it, perhaps it would work and perhaps it wouldn't have any of these neg negative implications. Like, we don't know, because I don't think the policy's been fully audited yet, as it, like, fully cost out in its entirety. But to have a focus on that, when there are so many, so much 
more clearly bigger issues suggest to me an ulterior motive, and I don't think that's particularly controversial. I mean, Tom, this uh, a poll done by Ipsos Mori for the BBC said that 74% of, of respondents support increasing charges for visitors from outside the EU to help fund the NHS. Um, the Department of Health and NHS target is to recover up to 500 million a year by 2017-18. Um, but there is a problem on the practicality of this policy. I mean, is there any... Uh, sort of clear view of how they are actually going to implement charging people up front for care? Is it the doctors who are going to have to go around charging them? I mean, you know, that's a vast problem because the NHS isn't set up as a healthcare system that's designed to charge patients and uh, meter their usage and, and, and so on. I mean, you know, there's a risk of it becoming something like the uh, child support agency where the administrative costs far outweighed yeah. anything that was recouped from, um, uh, from the users and from the taxpayers. So there is a real danger of that. And in fact, part of the thing is, right, why the NHS is per capita so cheap in the UK, which it is, even when it's run well, even under Labour 1, it was like run well on A&E waiting times, weren't as horrendous as they are at present. Per capita, it's very cheap. In part, that is because of these excess ad admin costs aren't there. Now, obviously, we don't know precisely because it hasn't been fully audited or fully costed or all the rest of it. And the fact this policy is really just something that's been dreamt up and it hasn't been costed in the least. But if it has that risk of then the administrative costs are very high, that anything recouped is just swallowed by admin. But it has to say, you know, there's a kind of political interest there with the poll that you mentioned. People see it as a reciprocation issue. Um, mm. And you see it when people sort of, when people withdraw their pension, when they use the NHS, they say, oh, yeah, I've paid in taxes all my life. So this is the kind of, this is a social care system that I've invested in, you know, I'm getting my just desserts. And there's a sense which that's missing for foreign nationals who paid into it. So, you know, I don't think we should under, uh, underestimate that. Okay, well, let's leave that, that uh, news there. The second bit of news is the housing white paper, which, of course, came out today. Um, Tom... The government is going back on this long-standing conservative commitment to home ownership, isn't it, by, by signalling that it's going to be a change of tone from previous Tory policy to more emphasis on the generation of renters. Is that a fair statement? Um, yes, in a sense it is. I mean, I've seen uh, conservatives on Twitter saying, if we don't fix the housing crisis, Jeremy Corbyn's going to win the next general election. Um, there's a real fear in the Tory party about the lack of action that's been taken on housing. Um, and uh, the, the previous government's um, schemes which were mainly focused around subsidising uh, homes to buy, you know, are really seen being deprioritised because the, the rental crisis is huge and it's Tory voting groups who are un under threat now and you know, that's why we've, we've seen a renewed attention on, uh, on the renting sector. In terms of Tory divisions on this, we had Andrew Mitchell uh, giving a piece on the Mail on Sunday uh, saying that my fear is that exceptional circumstances will soon uh, cease to be exceptional at all. He's talking about the development on green belt areas. Mm. How divisive and dangerous is this for the government in terms of a housing bill which potentially allows more development on the sacred green, build, uh, green belt site. Yeah, well, this is potentially explosive for the government. You've got um, conservative shire councils who've been very defensive of their green belt, and, and then you've got a housing crisis, and particularly on the issue, uh, you know, where you've got a, a city, uh, London or, you know, the other big cities, where there's just not enough room on the brownfield sites to build more housing. Um, and, you know, if they're going to persuade conservative councils to... Um, to allow more building on greenbelt land, which is what they're proposing in the paper, then they're essentially having to sort of force them to admit that they need a lot more houses than they're admitting. Um, and this could potentially be very politically difficult for local Conservative councillors. Emma, this is a very shrewd move by the government, isn't it? I mean, you've got um, a very large number of people who are now renting. It's increasing the house prices. I mean, it, it is a good policy, is it not? You know, correcting a serious problem in the housing housing sector. I think it's referred to as being in crisis by several MPs today. I mean, they obviously have just got to the stage where they recognise that they have to do something about it, right? Because the renting crisis, it, well, dilemma for like most under 30s, right, are in a situation where they have no foreseeable path to home ownership. And in London, I've, I think you can probably extend that to most under 45s. The situation is diabolical. It has taken the Tories a very long time to come round to this. And they've started to adopt almost, in times, almost Miliband-esque policies around it. Now, again, I think there's been, that rhetoric has been adopted and the policies perhaps are starting to sound as though they're getting towards that sort of thing. That's not to say they're actually confronting the more fundamental issues. And I think if we sort of wind this back a bit further, right, why is it, say, for instance, in London and a lot of other big cities that we don't have sufficient affordable housing to rent? And that's all because of Thatcherite policies of selling off council houses, right? Because the Tories worked out that if people own their own homes, they were more likely to vote Tory, and they never bothered to replace the stock that was sold off. That's a much bigger problem. And that, is, I think, is where you can point to why there are a lot of these issues, particularly in the bigger cities, and, and, and that, that's a, a real issue. And I think, again, with this housing bill, there's been an 
on a, on a different note, there's been a real missed opportunity to deal with the surge in homelessness and rough sleeping, which the government have mostly ignored. And they've cr really underfunded as well the homelessness reduction bill that has come through, that with the attached their funding to it, really underfunded b b compared to what Labour were, were proposing. And that there's a much bigger problem here. And yes, they might be starting to sound like they're dealing with the issue, but they're really ignoring lots of crucial aspects. OK, well, we're going to have to leave that there. Thank you very much, uh, Emma and Tom. We'll speak to you again very soon. Now, the question over the rights of British expats in the EU and EU nationals in the UK has been the background of Brexit for some time. But a new alternative white paper has been published by several organisations who are urgently pushing for more details from the government. For this week's In Focus, I spoke to Sue Wilson of Remain in Spain, Barbara Drozdovitz of the Eastern European Resource Centre and Katia Vidluck from Three Million Voices. So, Barbara, what is the prevailing concern, um, do you think, for EU nationals uh, living in the UK currently? Now, well, in the experience of, of East European Resource Centre, our charity, it's essentially um, the concerns are what will happen with us post-Brexit. So what will happen, what will be the legal status of EU nationals currently living in? What will be the legal status of EU nationals who might wish to join families? Um, and whether we would keep some form of freedom of movement and freedom of trade, quite frankly, because quite a lot of investments have been made and it would be nice to keep business going. Katia, you, as well as being a campaigner for Three Million Voices, you are an EU uh, national in the UK. Do you, do you find that that reflects your concerns yeah, as well? Yeah, it's exactly reflecting like uh, what the Three Millions is uh, actually uh, campaigning about. Uh, yeah, I'm a French national and I've been living in the UK for 16 years, but yeah, like, and it's not only about uh, people's legally being here in the country, it's for mm. everybody that is in the country at, at the moment. I mean, in terms of deportation or, you know, forcibly asking people to leave Britain post-Brexit, uh, do am I right in thinking that no one really uh, believes that there is going to be, you know, requests for deportation for EU nationals living in? There's going to be an arrangement allowing EU nationals living here to stay here if they've been residents here for you know, a number of years. Am I right, Lisa, uh, Katia? I don't think people need to be complacent and wait for something to happen. I think people need to kind of like start, um, you know, applying for permanent residency or try to uh, acquire certain rights because, you know, just saying that, you know, oh, nothing will happen to you it's not really like the best way forward. I would advise people to make the right arrangement to securing their rights, which is through campaigning and as well through different routes like uh, indefinite leave mm. to remain, permanent residency or becoming a British national. I mean, one thing, Barbara, that has been um, suggested in, in what's been written about in the past week is that EU residents fear discrimination post-Brexit or even now post the vote for Brexit. Um, particularly that there will be no European Court of Justice to protect your rights and um, you have to apply for residency permits and join queues for non-UK uh, nationals sorry, um, at airports and such like. Is that, is that correct? Is there a fear of discrimination? Has there been a noticeable change in the way uh, people who you deal with are, are being viewed? Yes, yes, post-Brexit post, post -Brexit referendum, not even before that. I mean, let's, let's look at the global context of the campaign around Brexit rather than just uh, isolated political events. Um, there is the marked increased level of, of uncertainty and that translates into fears about um, the situation we are currently in, how the, the way how our children are treated at school, the way how we are treated by our employers and so on and so forth. Has, has there been a difference since the Brexit vote last June? Have you well, noticed a palpable distance or had a number of more complaints about issues to do with discrimination in the UK? There is no huge difference either way. So there is heightened level of, of, of anxiety, of uncertainty, um, but there seem not to be... the, the, the this level does not seem to go down as we expected. We expected the moods would be more kind of subdued by now. Um, having said that, we have direct questions from our users relating their immigration status as we are now. Therefore, it is, fun it is fundamentally important for many people to really understand what is it that this immigration situation there are going to be. Uh, as Katia did mention, there is no, we can't afford com complacency. 
EU nationals or the people who work with them, I mean, colleagues and businesses and so on and so forth. Okay, well, this is a good time to bring in uh, Sue Wilson, the chair of Remain in Spain. Um, Sue, what is the prevailing concern then for uh, UK expats who are living in the EU at the moment? Uh, the main concern would be uh, health care, and also people are very concerned about pensions. Uh, there are 108,000 uh, British pensioners in Spain, but obviously there are also a lot more who are approaching pension age. So the issue of pensions and free, if you can call it that, health care, is obviously something that people are very concerned about. And it's certainly the, the two issues that we spoke most about when we presented to the Select Committee uh, for the Exit in the EU Department in, uh, in January. In terms of what the government has said and done so far, this notion of a transitional deal, um, which allows uh, a, a certain period of time for people, such as expats, to uh, react to what the changes which are happening. You know, have you found some comfort in the assurances the government are giving over the desire for a transitional deal? Uh, we haven't found, any, we haven't found any reassurance at all so far. Uh, they haven't said anything to us directly. They keep talking to us and uh, calling us stakeholders and saying that they've consulted with us, but uh, that's not strictly true. Um, certainly uh, one of the things that we mentioned when I was talking to them was about the, the pensions is actually something that is paid for entirely by the British government. So there's no need for any kind of negotiation with the EU in order for them to guarantee that our pensions are going to be protected. And because it, they're entirely funded by the British government. And so it, they can make that decision on their own. And, and just to, to talk about this alternative white paper, which your organisation has put, put their name towards, what is it hoping to achieve um, in, in the coming weeks or months or even years? Um, certainly, the purpose was to demonstrate that we needed to go into a lot more detail about all the various topics that should have been covered in the government white paper. Uh, it's been very well received by MPs and the House of Lords, and we've had a lot of coverage in the press about it as well. It was really trying to highlight some of the issues, and in particular with regards to EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the EU, it was pointing out things like, you know, there are things that can be agreed that are not based on uh, uh, recipro reciprocity. Okay, I mean, do you accept, this is an interesting point, because Theresa May has uh, said, you know, we want to guarantee the rights of EU citizens who are already living in Britain and the rights of Britain, uh, Britons in other member states as early as we can. And she uh, criticised the actions of not all, but some EU leaders uh, when she put this to them. Uh, earlier in January uh, this year. So, I mean, Katia, do you, do you think there is a, an element of the angers being directed the wrong way in, this, in the sense the government has said everything that it, it needed to say to give these assurances? Exactly. And the thing is, like, the UK is deciding to leave the European Union. And uh, for the three millions, we think it's kind of uh, immoral to use uh, that you know, like the three millions like EU citizens living in the UK as a bargaining chip. The thing is, Theresa May could do a good gesture and open the negotiation with something which is fair to our sense because people came here in the goodwill. You know, it's not like we, you know, we came through a visa. People settle. A lot of people are settled in the, in the UK. Sure. I mean, but is there not, do you not see any... Uh point that Theresa May is making here that she wants a reciprocal deal. She, all she's asking for is for the 27 seven EU nation states to guarantee uh, a good faith arrangement with the expat, uh, expats which are living there. Barbara, perhaps you can come in here. Well, quite frankly, the European Union is, is put together out of 28 countries, of which Britain is only one of them. And this is exactly the negotiations that are facing uh, Prime Minister Miss May. Um, it is probably going to be quite complex process negotiating the situation and not everything within the European Union is the blanket approach. Also equally not every country, not every national leader is is in agreement with the the atmosphere built around sure. the Brexit so negotiations. Can you not blame Theresa May then for, for really pushing some kind of guarantees EU wide before she gives the a decision for the guarantees of I am not entirely sure whether um, whether that's a fair situation. 
because it is in fact as the three million campaign points out of Britain leaving the European Union. Therefore, it, it, it begs the question why would have to EU safeguard British uh, future in, in, uh, in Europe? And there is an element of the, how we feel as a bargaining chips, and that's unavoidable currently. Katia, you're going to come in there. Right? Yeah, it's just like uh, obviously within the, uh, you know, like until Article 50 is triggered. There's no negotiation that can happen before, you know, like that, that, that's mm. our argument, you know, like then she, you know, Theresa May can't try to make deals before Article 50 is triggered, then it's all on good faith, you know, and I think to open negotiation when Article 50 is triggered, it, it's, I think it's moral, morally right to actually guarantee the rights of uh, EU citizens living here and it is like whatever tension that could happen within the 27 like EU other country mm. around like UK citizen living in the country. You know. I mean, Sue Wilson, uh, do you respect what May is trying to do here in the sense that uh, for the expats she's, she's given uh, as far as she could go without actually giving a unilateral decision on uh, the EU residents, she's what she claim she's doing is fighting for the expats and making sure that there is a fair deal um, for them in these negotiations or is it do you see or at least feel that the government is is using that uh, inaccurately and using that as, a, as an excuse which which doesn't really merit any you know uh, credit for you I do feel that um, it's an excuse I think she's trying to lay the blame with the European Union if she was truly acting on our behalf, then she would be listening to what all the uh, groups of UK citizens across Europe are saying, which is the right and moral thing to do is to um, unilaterally make the decision to protect the rights of EU citizens in the UK. Nobody is arguing that. We all agree with that. Even if some might say that might look as though that's not in our best interests, we don't agree with that. We think not only is it the moral thing to do, but I think it would also improve relations with the EU and that would help the negotiations going forward. OK, right, we're going to have to leave it there. Sue Wilson, Chair of Remain in Spain, thank you very much for coming on. As well in the studio, Barbara Drozdovitz and uh, Katia Vidlak, uh, campaigner of Three Million Voices and obviously CEO of East Europe uh, Resource Centre. And joining us now is Dr. Heather Rolf, Director of Employment and Social Policy at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. Uh, Heather, what has been the impact of Brexit on the, or the lack of clarity on Brexit so far, on employers of EU workers in the UK? Well, we interviewed employers before and after Brexit. And after Brexit, one of their main concerns was the lack of clarity around the status of EU migrants um, in the UK, particularly employers who, who depend very heavily, heavily on um, EU migrants, such as in the hospitality sector, food and drink sector, they really want to make sure that they can retain the EU workers that they have. And is it becoming increasingly, uh, or there's less opportunities now increasingly becoming available to EU workers in these companies because they don't want that level of uncertainty and that commitment to workers who might not be potentially here in a few years? No, abs absolutely not. Employers don't have that attitude at all. They do want to continue recruiting EU migrants. They're by no means certain that um, free movement is even going to end. Although I think they're becoming increasingly um, sure that, that probably that that, that, that isn't going to happen. Um, but, um, but they do want to continue recruiting them. Um, their concern is that they're losing them um, because um, those EU workers are not sure that they, have, they will have the right to stay here in the longer term. And so you had what they call a Christmas effect, where migrants go back home to Poland, visit their family, and actually fewer return. That's, that's anecdotal, but um, we've heard quite a few cases of, of that happening. But certainly the main, the main problem is a concern among employers that they won't be able to recruit them in future. So there's a big problem then all I mean, anecdotal, so there isn't statistical evidence of this quite yet, but that EU workers are less willing now to come to Britain uh, to work because of Brexit and the uncertainty around it. I think there's concern that, that they'll be going back um, to, rather than new migrants coming over, there's concern that actually the existing migrants will be going back home um, because they're unsure about their future. It's not only that they're unsure about their future jobs, of course, there's issues around currency in that their pay is now getting, is worth 
less than it was. Um, and so they're kind of, you know, I think when you decide to work elsewhere, it's, it's quite a delicate balance of costs and benefits, and they see things as actually going the other way. For some people who perhaps, uh, you know, voted uh, to leave the European Union, they might listen to this and they might say, well, less, let potentially less EU workers uh, available for employers, perhaps then they will look to using British workers instead who've been, you know, mm. so, so sw the market's been so swamped since we were, uh, joined the EU. Um, what would you say to that? Is that, is that? is that a likely solution that the employers are going to go, well, we're going to have to use British workers now? Um, because we have less um, supply of, of EU workers. Mm, I think there's a, a bit of a misunderstanding really there about, um, we, you know, which is quite common, um, about why employers recruit EU migrants. They don't recruit them out of preference. They're very much a last resort. And they don't set out generally to target EU migrants, but because they can't recruit enough EU uh, UK workers. I think, uh, you know, in the, in the light of Brexit, employers are looking for ways in which they might increase um, uh, the recruitment of of UK workers, but there are quite a few barriers uh, to overcome for that to happen in the sectors that are heavily reliant on migrant workers. And so what, in terms of what these kind of uh, businesses and employers are looking for from the government to steady the ship, as it were, what exactly, is there anything they're really wanting the government to be doing? I think their first choice would be to continue free movement. Um, so they want some kind of guarantee that they'll be able to recruit the numbers that, that they need. There's some interest in sector-based schemes. So that would mean a sector like hospitality or food and drink processing would, uh, would be able to recruit workers maybe for a temporary period. Um, and um, you know there might be quotas. Employers see that as very much second best. Um, but, um, but I think they're willing to, to consider those kind of options rather than have EU migration cut off altogether. OK, Dr Heather Rolfe, thank you very much. Um, let's turn now to the Article 50 debate. Obviously, there's been a development this afternoon um, that the government will bring forward a motion uh, on a final agreement to be approved by both Houses of Parliament. This is something which there's been a lot of uh, discussion and rebellion about. Um, over the past few weeks. Um, Emma, perhaps if we can start with you. Is this, do you see this as a concession from the government to the pressure it was put under in the Commons and in the Lords? Yeah, I mean, it was yes and no, right? Like there has been a concession in the timing of the vote because they've previously mentioned that they are going to have a vote, which again in and of itself in May's Lancaster House speech, that was a concession after the pressure from Labour, specifically Keir Starmer pushing them to have any vote, pushing Parliament to have a say in the process. And the fact that we're getting this vote before the European Parliament gets a vote on it is a concession. However, it seems to, at the moment that it's sounding like this vote will be either you vote for the deal that we get from Europe, i.e. the Tory government gets from Europe, or we fall back on World Trade Organisation rules. Now, that, to my mind, is not an excellent concession because the options there are quite stark, right? We don't know, obviously, what the final Brexit deal will look like. We obviously hope for as good a deal as possible. Um, but the Tories have made no movement to suggest that they're actually going to back up certain and really important things, like, for instance, workers' rights, like, for instance, um, having that good access to the single um, to the single market. I mean, obviously, they've ruled out membership, but they talk about things like frictionless access, as smooth an access as possible. I mean... These are just very bizarre words that kind of mean nothing, right? Like, we have had very little actual specific detail. So if it's a case of a mythical detail, a mythical deal that we really hope can be as good as possible or World Trade Organization rules, that's not excellent. Right. I mean, Tom, Sir Keir Starmer, of the Shadow Brexit Secretary, of course, said in the Commons after the announcement was made that this is a huge and very important concession. Um, do you see it this way? Do you agree with Emma? Is, is, there, a, is there a concession here? Um, I think the concession, if there is one, is very small indeed. It's one of timing. I mean, Labour, of course, in, said they were going to do a three-line whip before this concession was even announced. So even before they had their amendments accepted, Labour were going to enforce three-line whip anyway. Um, what this concession is, you know, as Emma said, it's a mo it would be a choice between uh, a bad option and a worse option, between WTO rules and between accepting the deal that the government had argued for. Uh, you know, of course, the difficulty is, uh, if May is seen as offering a vote which would enable MPs to reject her deal and go back to the European Commission and negotiate some more, then that would negotiate that would weaken her negotiating hand in the initial round of negotiations because the European Commission would know that she would, you know, always be able to go away and come back with more. I mean if this was, as you say, not, not a particularly significant concession for the government to make, why has it taken this long and this sort of so much uproar to be made about it from Conservative MPs as well as Labour MPs as well as SNP and Green MPs and 
Um, why is it? Why didn't the government just say this straight away when it was first suggested? It seems like. Um, you know, a reasonable thing to do. Yeah, I mean, it seems like these concessions have been dragged out of the government, kicking and screaming the whole way, um, and they only produced the white paper because Labour and Keir Starmer, you know, argued and argued at them. Um, and then, you know, at this last interval, they've said, no, you can have a vote, and that was in the Lan Lancaster House speech. Um, you know, really, I think it's because there's one sense in which the government, you know, it doesn't have all of its plan there yet, so it's trying to leave itself space uh, to manoeuvre and to, you know, d decide internally what it's going to do. Um, but it's also because they want to leave things to uh, the last minute as possible to get themselves, you know, space to choose. Well, I, I think mean, this fits into a pattern, right, from Theresa. Like, the fact that why did they, why did the government have this pointless court battle with Gina Miller, when it was always going to come out that Parliament has to have a say, because as, you know, has been repeated oft by the Brexit campaigners, we want a sovereign Parliament, we want to bring power back to the UK. Well, Parliament is sovereign, of course Parliament has to do these things, right? You know, I think this is more indicative of a broader management style that Theresa May has, in that she wants to micromanage, right? And so therefore to concede any little thing, which Labour have had to drag out, kicking and screaming, as people have said, right, has had to have that degree of pressure for her to do even, even these things. In terms of Labour, though, Labour though, I mean, certainly from the way I'm watching it, um, Jeremy Corbyn's in the background here. This is, this is Keir Starmer, seems to be the, the leader, UK, uh, the leader, sorry, Labour, um, needs to have in terms of scrutinising Brexit and really holding Theresa May's feet to the fire. I mean, in fairness to Jeremy, right, Keir is the Brexit secretary, shadow Brexit secretary. He is also a former shadow attorney general. Like, he's clearly, this is kind of his thing, right? He's, he's very qualified for his role and he's clearly very competent within it in, in various different ways. Um, and, I, you know, has Jeremy made absolutely every single perfect strategic decision recently on this issue? Perhaps not, but also it's an incredibly tricky situation for Labour, right? Like, everyone's accepted that. Keir himself has said that quite clearly. It's not nice when you've got two-thirds of your voters supporting Remain, when you've got, the, like, basically all of the PLP supporting Remain, bar a few exceptions, and then you've got to somehow coalesce behind, um, coalesce behind a Brexit deal that works for works of the country. It's, it's very, very tricky. And also in the face of us having no idea what the government are even going to push for. OK, well, we're going to have to leave that there. We're just going to have some final thoughts. Um, John Burko, uh, Speaker of the House of Commons, has been in the news uh, on the, in the headlines a lot today about uh, his uh, decision not to support uh, Donald Trump having a speech in, in the House of Commons, uh, particularly in Westminster Hall. Um, the Spectator called uh, this... John Burko is grandstanding over this issue. Tom, do you, do you agree with that, or do you think he's making I think he point? possibly went a little bit too far. I mean, you know, one doesn't have to have any positive feelings for President Trump um, to think that the role of the Speaker, you know, is to represent the House of Commons and to represent MPs. And I'm sure that, you know, MPs would be loath to attach themselves in any way to, um, to, to President Trump. But he's coming on a state visit. He's been invited. You know, he, he's coming here. Um, so to then make this a spectacle of embarrassment for him before he's even arrived with the, with the speech that John Burko did, I think is, is really difficult. Emma, just to, just to go on the point, a, a point was raised yesterday evening that the president of China, who's a, a one-party human rights abusing state, yeah. some have yeah, said, yeah, yeah. Um, addressed the Royal Gallery less than two years ago when yeah. John Burko was speaking. Is there not an element of uh, you know, hypocrisy here on, on his part? Personally, I actually very strongly agree with Burke on this actually like for one thing aside from whether or not he's grandstanding right like it literally is his job to decide who does or doesn't get to speak in like parliament right like that like is a factor of his role aside from any like political comments that you want to make it aside from that it is that is just fact on the fact that china the chinese president and like other less savory characters might have at some point had state visits or at some point got to address parliament to some degree china is moving in a direction that is i think you can argue broadly positive the United States is currently moving in a direction that is completely and utterly horrendous, right? We have a president that is dragging what is meant to be the world's leading liberal democracy towards, it sounds more like an African dictator at the moment, right? Like, let's not beat around the bush. And also, I think there's a, a, a massive point we made about how this isn't just about even the state visit, right? This is a unique honour to get to address Parliament. And it isn't, and it isn't de facto that it would happen if he comes on a state visit, aside from whether or not we think he should come on a state visit either. And 
President Trump is the sort of person that responds to things like he likes the grand stuff. There's a reason his lift is playing in gold, right? He wants to be able to do the grand stuff. He wants to hang out with the Queen. He wants to come to Parliament and he wants to have all of the MPs sit there nodding and looking at him very happily. Frankly, if we can use any of these sorts of tactics as a way to address any degree of influence over the man and stop his abhorrent policies against Muslims and like his, his general disgustingness on pretty much everything, his like general disdain for the free free press, then have at it. And right. yeah. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Heather Rolf, for coming on, uh, as well as Emma Bean and Tom Follett. Now, that's all we've got time for this week. Thank you to all my guests, and don't forget you can find videos, comments, and much more on our Facebook page and on Twitter at Tip TV Politics. See you next week from the latest news from Westminster and beyond. Goodbye.